listening to the Lutheran Ladies Lounge podcast. I'm Sarah. I'm Erin. And I'm Rachel. Erin is currently in a car recording this. This is dedication <laughs> on Erin's part. So <laughs> we appreciate Erin being here for this recording. The miracle of technology. Yes. <laughs> Yes. We have a very special guest today. So this wasn't one we could just be like recording whenever we wanted to. We've got someone joining us and he's a very special guest for multiple reasons. So Rachel, this is a book club wrap up episode. Tell us who's joining us today and why. (laughs) Okay. Well, I'll start with the why first. As you all will no doubt remember, our book club pick for January is George Herbert's collection of poetry, The Temple. And it's a very unusual pick for us, maybe a little older, maybe a little denser than some of what we've done. But it was on the list of books that helped C.S. Lewis become C.S. Lewis. Mm-hmm. So that was made it a valid choice for us during this year of understanding that phenomenon. Mm-hmm. But I also happened to remember that somebody that I spent a lot of time with a couple of decades ago happens to be an expert in George Herbert's poetry. And so I jumped at the chance to see if we could invite Dr. Eric Angerberg, who is the newly inaugurated president of my alma mater, Concordia University, Wisconsin, and Ann Arbor. Is that the official name? It is. It is. Excellent. All right. I got it. (laughs) Dr. Angerberg is joining us from Mequon, Wisconsin today, and we are so excited to have him. Welcome, Dr. Angerberg. Hello. Great to be with you today. Always a great day when we get to talk about poetry. So indeed, there you indeed. go. Indeed. <laughs> so I know your time is precious. You've got a, two okay. universities to run. So let's jump right in. <laughs> Who was George Herbert, and why do we get so excited about him? Well, you and I, maybe not everyone. <laughs> it's a great question, and it's a great choice. I mean, it's it's probably not the first place I would have gone. I did not know he was on a list for C.S. Lewis's influence. That's interesting. Yeah. He was sort of rediscovered in the early part of the 20th century. And a lot of that has to do with, well, I think it's, it was a rediscovery of 17th century poetry as being a valuable and important part of British culture. So Herbert lived late 1500s, early 1600s, only lives to be about 40 years old, comes from a pretty well-established, wealthy family with its origins in Wales in the United Kingdom. He was very well connected. His mother was good friends with John Donne, <laughs> another poet for your next collection of poetry. To yes. <laughs> and Herbert, I mean, this is one of the things I love about him. He had these great aspirations. He was a brilliant student at Cambridge. He was named student orator, which meant he was asked to write poetry for special occasions in Latin and Greek and very gifted. And he had this great life of preferment in front of him. And we don't fully know what happened, but somewhere along the way, life goes sideways for him. And he ends up taking holy orders and becomes a priest in the Church of England and spends four years in the small town of Bemerton, which is just outside of Salisbury. And dies of tuberculosis at age 44. And during his lifetime, we are assuming it was either right before he became a priest or early in his time at Bemerton. He writes this collection of poetry that you've been studying, and it gets published out after his death because of his couple of his friends. But that is what he's known for. And you know, it li- the poetry has life in the 17th century. And then There's a a generation of poets that were very much influenced by him throughout the 17th century. And then as British culture changes, things become more secularized. Herbert sort of fades into the oblivion and is rediscovered in the early part of the 20th century. And then was promptly forgotten again. I mean, he's got life. There's still a George Herbert Society, of which I'm a lifetime member. I love it. (laughs) The George Herbert Society meets frequently, and I mean, there's more there than people know, but uh, it's a relatively small collection of poetry and it's an acquired taste in some sense, but it's, you know, its strength lies in, you know, I'll, back, going back to my work as a, as an English professor, I would like to talk about three modes of poetry. It often yes. is dramatic. It's often lyric, or it means it's about 
musical kinds of elements, and it's often narrative, tells a story, right? Mm -hmm. Herbert does a great job of incorporating all three of those modes and does so in this really interesting way. He's part of some of the language, and we don't use this so much in literary studies anymore, but part of a tradition in the 16th, 17th century of what was often called metaphysical poetry in the 20th century, that it was poetry that is that is about the transcendent and trying to engage the transcendent. Uh, John Donne, who I mentioned before, is probably most famous for being part of that kind of thinking. Herbert is, is certainly in that space, too, of taking ordinary physical objects and trying to show how they have so much more possibility and imaginative and spiritual significance than maybe we think about at first at first thought. Well, it's interesting that you mention him in conjunction with John Donne, because I have loved John Donne since I first encountered John Donne. I think maybe anthologists, because most pe- most students will never study George Herbert. Everyone just about Art's gets exposed everywhere right now. to yeah. a little bit of John Donne. But I remember which poem it was of Herbert's that showed up in the anthologies that I studied most often. Okay. Easter Wings. Yes. Which yes. I don't think oh. is his best work, but because it was a concrete poem, it mm. was put in as an example of concrete poetry. That is poetry where the words form a picture just with the very mm-hmm. shape of the way the lines are arranged. Uh-huh. No. And I don't know. I think maybe he was shortchanged a little bit that way because now when I've gone back, and actually read him, I think he will, he's right there next to Dunn for me. I will be coming back to this volume again mm. and again throughout the rest of my life because there's so much richness there. Well, that shows the multiple dimensions with Herbert's poetry, right? That physical, mm-hmm. like, that physical dimension of seeing the words on the page and how they're published out and how they create this visual image is, is another piece of how his poetry works. And it, yeah. it's something to be heard, yes. But it's also something to be seen on a page, mm-hmm. to be read aloud, to it, it just functions with these these multiple dimensions at once. And so he's very sophisticated that way. Yeah. So I have a question with that. So when yeah. when he was writing it originally, I assume he wrote it in by hand, long longhand. Yes. And then it would have yep. so he would have he sort of designed it with it in mind that when it was printed, he wanted it printed in this way. Yes. That was is, his poetry we... published in his lifetime or was it mostly posthumous? It was all posthumous. It was oh, a collection okay. of the collection of poems was handed off to, I believe it was his friend Nicholas Farrar, who was mm-hmm. sort of an Anglican divine who hung out at Little Getting, which you know, if you are familiar with different 20th century British religious poets, it Little Getting is kind of a shrine for them. It's a, a mm. church and a now it's a retreat center, so it's it's an interesting place. Nicholas Farrar was sort of a recluse there. He had the collection of poetry and publishes that out after Herbert hmm. dies. That was his English poetry. He did publish some yes. Latin poetry in his lifetime. He did, yes. There was a little bit, you know, again, part of that being a Cambridge student orator and all of that. He did some of that work. But nobody really knew he could write poetry in English. No, until... that, was not, that was not his big thing. Yeah. yeah it, was, hmm. it was, and it's this weird... It's always a, it's interesting to conjecture about his life. Like, did, was he depressed and sad that he didn't chase the things that were really important to him? There's all these issues about ego and status and all that just keeps appearing in the poems. It's such a fascinating kind of thing. It's, is it a sin to be someone that aspires to do great things, to do great yeah. art? Is mm-hmm. that something that, how does one manage the ego? Mm-hmm. and and live as a Christian. And it's really interesting to sort of see those lines running through different versions of his work. Because there's clearly an ego. Yeah. And he, he knows he's good at many things. That's, and at the yeah. same time, he's really pious, too. There's a great piety that, that just manifests itself in the poetry. That intersection of ambition, talent, and mm-hmm. devotion. That he knows yeah. he has talent. He's not blind. Yeah. Right. He grapples with whether or not he should have ambition, but the devotion sort of supersedes both in the end, I think. It does. And I think it's also, then there's the biography and the real life reality that he was on a trajectory to serve at court. Mm -hmm. And King James Court, James was the monarch during most of his lifetime. 
It was a strange place. And I, I think his piety probably was not a good match for the, what was by reputation, a kind of wild and debaucherous court. <laughs> Something went sideways there and he did not end up in government service. And you just wonder if he regretted that or it was okay with it. Mm. It's if you've ever been to Bemerton, it's a little sleepy wide spot in the road outside of Salisbury and it's worth the pilgrimage. I have taken students there and it is, it is worth the pilgrimage, but it is also, it's not what he expected or anticipated or probably hoped for. for it's himself. a long way from Cambridge or from the court of the King at London. Oh, yeah. Now he was out, he was out in the country, Uh-huh. a yeah, very different life. Now but he before- also embraced that. I mean, he writes. One of the other books that published by him, and I believe it's published after his death as well, is a short guy called The Country Parson about how to be a Anglican priest in the country. And I believe Hal Sinkbile used to use it in one of his courses at Fort Wayne Seminary. Oh, Great wow. choice. That's awesome. It's a neat little book about how to, how to be a, an effective priest to God's people in a, in a very rural setting. Hmm. So. Well, Cool. It looks like he, he embraced it. Before so. we get too far into this interview, I just have to confess to our to our listeners how it was that I knew you were a George Herbert <laughs> expert. And that is 20-something years ago when you were a newly minted professor at Concordia Ann Arbor, and I was a student there spending just basically the ultimate English nerd in the English department. I happen to know that you were at the time working on your thesis yes. that later was published under the title Toward a Reformed Confession, Johann Gerhardt's Sacred Meditation and Repining Restlessness in the Poetry of George Herbert. And I remember <laughs> thinking at the time, one, I don't think I actually, I'm, I'm fine with getting a master's degree. I don't think I need a PhD. <laughs> <laughs> but two, I never, Rachel. Actually, this is the man who talked me into going on to get my master's degree. Oh, well, there you go. So thank you for that. I hope that was a wise, a wise thing. Rachel, Jury's you're one still of the out, but it was fun. You're one of the best students I ever had. So, for my, my, you made my job easy. It was just get out of your way. And, uh, <laughs> that checks out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I so. can believe that. Uh, well, we're derailing the congr- a conversation no. right here. My real question is, no. why did you pick George Herbert to focus so much of your energy on? Because, and I get it now, but I did not at the time. When no, you write a dissertation on somebody, you spend a lot of quality time with that writer. Yeah. No. I, professionally, it probably would have been smarter to do Shakespeare or Milton to get a job. But... <laughs> The oh, Lord gosh. works in incredible ways. So I got to be at Ann Arbor and teach you. So that's, that's the Aww. good. You know, I, I was introduced to Herbert as an undergraduate student at Concordia, Chicago. It was Lila Kurth's <gasps> Renaissance course. And I love Lila, Lila Kurth. made sure we read Herbert. And there was just something that ha- has always haunted me about this guy. Whether it's his short life, candidly, I think it's really this, he's okay with tussling with God. Yeah, there is, there is this. There is a little bit of rage that he carries around. He has a chip on his shoulder. He's really faithful and pious, and he often gets dismissed for that as, as being sort of provincial and isn't he cute? But there's more edge under the surface about his relationship with God than we give him credit for, and I really respect that. As in, as I get older and maybe a little more mature in my life. I value that. I think there's something about the Christian faith and it's, it's our Lord's ability to accommodate our um, wrestling with him mm-hmm. on, on some of the things that we experience. And I think that's in Herbert's stuff. And he, he ends up in a, the right place in terms of being faithful, but it's, it's also not without acknowledging there's cost to that or in challenge. And so I, I think that's, and it's, it's just, it's beautiful lyric poetry too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's, I, I think you're, you're so right that rarely since, you know, King David was writing his Psalms of Lament, has a poet had the guts to write in faith, in love, in piety, but in this like deeply honest, ragged kind of way mm-hmm. toward, toward God. And you read it and it doesn't, it doesn't feel inappropriate. 
it feels honest. Yeah, I I love the, the candor that he brings to it. And again, when you put that with the biography, you can kind of understand it. It's it was not a not some sort of easy path for him. So mm-hmm. especially I think for the last three or four years of his life, he you know, he had both lost his path of preferment professionally and he had knew he had tuberculosis and was likely gonna die at a relatively young age. Didn't so, he get married during that time as well? Yeah, he, he gets married, drags his wife off to Bemberton. <laughs> They're living in the house across the street from the small church. He's probably buried under the altar at a small church in Bemberton. And it's just, it wasn't what he thought it was going to be. That's, yeah. that's my assumption. Yeah. I want to ask my co-hosts who did not have the privilege of studying under Dr. Engelberg when they were undergrads and presumably are newer to Herbert even than I am. What was your take on this? Was this something that you dreaded? Just one of those, oh, that crazy Rachel with her crazy book club choice. (laughs) What did you think? Yeah. So, well, and uh, full disclosure, I am also, I've known the Ankerbergs also for over (laughs) 20 years now because I had Dr. Ankerberg's wife as my English teacher in eighth grade, seventh and eighth grade. She's a lot smarter than I am. So, but... (laughs) She's one of the reasons why I love him so much. So there's there's good. that part of, my, She's the best. part of my origin story. She's the best. So I honestly, I can't remember if I've read any Herbert. Maybe I have, and I just didn't know. The one that I know is from Capella at Concordia Chicago okay. for one of our tours. We sang an arrangement of Love 3, and that I love, love, love that poem so much. And so when you when you suggested doing his whole book, I was like, yes, I know one poem out of here. <laughs> Talk about that poem. That's a great poem. It it's, is. It's so good. And I know it in my head. I know it's set to music. So like it, it's even more. Right. And there's like all of the, you know, emotional connection to that tour and the singing with people and all that. But, you know, when stuff like that is set to music, there you get a, a deeper love for it and it, it kind of sticks with you in a different way. So I think Thomas Geeshan liked Herbert. So mm. yeah. <laughs> no, that was a, a good, and it probably <laughs> would not have been called Love Three. Herbert probably called it Love and it and it's simply known as the third of the love poems because he mm. recycled these blasted titles. But <laughs> And I don't think it's a lack of creativity, but Vaughn Williams, Mystical Songs, that's all yeah. Herbert text. So they, they, they really do lend themselves to music. And Herbert was a musician himself, played the lute, and he was, he was probably fairly accomplished there, too. Yeah. The Renaissance man that way. Sarah loves Vaughn Williams. I do love Vaughn Williams. <laughs> How do you not know these mystical texts, Sarah? You've got a new, a new well, area to explore. Herbert with Vaughn yes. Williams. Bye. Bye, Vaughn Williams. Yes. You know, and I didn't listen to those before this. I need to go listen to them now. But I, I was not intimidated by doing a book of poetry because I, I trust your literary choices, Rachel. I knew this was going to be a great experience, even if I was, I don't know. <laughs> but I remember what I told you guys when I started reading this. It was on a break uh, yes. in between my master's classes. And I was like, this this book is is dessert, like, <laughs> but not just like cookies. This is like the German chocolate rich <laughs> dessert that I need mm-hmm. in my life right now. It was just like this wonderful, because I'm, you know, immersed in leadership reading, which is yes. great, but it's very, I mean, it's academic and it's what I'm learning and I have to learn it because I got to do assignments. And this was just like a f- breath of fresh air to my soul reading through this stuff. And and I was I was like reading while Luther was trying to go to sleep one night. <laughs> I kept whacking him. I was like, listen, listen, I, have to- <laughs> I did the same thing. Poor Ken. He <laughs> likes to listen to like ambient music on his head, his noise canceling headphones to fall asleep. And I'd be like, take your headphone out. I got another one. I promise. Yeah, Just we'll one listen. more. Yeah, I was totally he can being receptive to them. Yeah, <laughs> he was. He loved them. He he never gets tired when I when I ask him to listen Good to man. something. Uh, yeah. <laughs> But yeah, I wish I could go back, Sarah. I've, I'm trying to search our, th- our um, chat thread, which is like, <laughs> I don't know, several million mm-hmm. words long mm-hmm. at this point. But you sort of diving into this volume and me expecting you to be like, oh, this is so hard, you guys. I mean, I do know that you're a smart cookie and can handle this. But at the same time, it was a lot to ask. But know oh. that you just sort of sending me screenshot mm-hmm. after screenshot of poems and commenting on how much how delighted you were by them. So yeah. I was pleasantly surprised. I really hope all the rest of our book club ladies 
have the same experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I said, I had no idea this was so delightful. And it feels like dessert reading, not fluff. Good hearty German chocolate cake dessert. That's what I said. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Nice. So I also really enjoyed it. I have read poems and poetry, obvious, but I don't think I've ever really like read multiple poems by the same author for an extended time. I don't know. I've never read books of poetry. That hasn't, I haven't, Mm. I haven't studied poetry. I don't feel like I ever took a class on poetry. Yeah, I was the science major, so I I didn't take any, I didn't take any English classes in college. (laughs) So (laughs) Erin, it's okay. It's never too late. Exactly. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Now here is something we could meet weekly on Zoom. (laughs) Here's something that I observed in this experience with poetry as I was reading along. I found that poetry, or at least this kind of poetry, was much better. If I read with my, okay, this is going to sound weird, but anyway, I was reading some, again, in preparation for this meeting in the car, and I'm with my coworker in the car, and it, I was like, well, I didn't want to just read these poems aloud. That felt weird. So I read them, but I just, like, I had my mouth silently moving. Well, it felt mm. better to yeah. actually have my lips forming the words is what I'm trying to say than to only read with my eyes. I don't know if it's because it slowed it down and allowed me to feel the rhythm of it, to have my my lips making that without even just speaking lots. If I'd been truly alone, I would have probably just read them out loud to myself. And I felt like I engaged better with it in that way mm-hmm. than when I just try to read them without using my physical I don't I'm not sure exactly how to say what I say but I think you understand what I am attempting and failing to put into actual words well if I may try to sound like a Lutheran for a moment right there's a very kind of liturgical experience to all of this yes and the ah. poetry it brings the body the physicality the the oral what one hears what one speaks one sees there's there's kind of this holistic experience about poetry that's a good thing mm-hmm. so i think you were also picking up aaron on what dr ankerberg mentioned earlier and that is herbert's skill as a lyric poet yes yeah someone who really recognizes the musical quality of words arranged in this particular way and you wanted to feel the music mm-hmm. mm. yeah i think that definitely is an element of it. Some of them were clearly ones I appreciated with my eyes, like the one poem that you highlighted for us, Rachel, and now I don't remember the name of it, but basically that the lat it was each stanza was in three lines and the last word of each stanza was in all caps and he dropped one letter for for each one. So it was like oh, yeah. tart art. <laughs> and anyway, yes. that one was on that one was appealing to the eyes as well as lyrically. I very much enjoyed the the whole experience with it and sure. definitely had some standout poems that I appreciated, but also really appreciated the experience of just reading them more slowly and felt that really enhanced the experience mm-hmm. of it. Yeah, this is definitely not stuff you're just going to fly through. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which, I mean, which makes sense. It was, the whole point, well, I shouldn't say the whole point. You guys are the poetry experts, but I feel like one of the points of poetry is to read it slowly. Like you, reading poetry fast just doesn't feel right. Because you, it's, it's like, it's, it's short. I mean, but during my undergraduate days, there were certainly times when I read lots of poetry really fast. I mean, that's fair. Because the course <laughs> syllabus is pretty merciless that way. Mm. But there were also times when I went back over Christmas break and reread some favorites at the yeah. proper pace. Right. Like, you got to digest it and, like, you got to let it sink Mm -hmm. in. And you can't let Mm -hmm. it sink in if you're flying about it. It's the invitation that you're a different person each time you come into contact with a text. And you're going to appreciate different things at different times. I'm not necessarily ever going to advocate that you, even if you read something slowly and carefully one time, that you're you're mining it fully in that reading. Mm. I I think one of the joys of texts like poetry 
And I think hymns are like this too. The Psalms are like this. You come yeah. back to text in different seasons of life or different experiences and different things jump out at you or stick in your mind. Mm -hmm. And that's, mm -hmm. that's yeah. a valuable thing. Yeah. It's not a one-time thing. I yeah. went through a lecture series with my kids when we were studying Dante's Divine Comedy and the professors who were leading that lecture series had this great insight. They said, when you finish reading Dante, you're ready to begin reading Dante. <laughs> and I think that might hold true for Herbert as well. When you finish reading Herbert, you might be ready to begin reading Herbert. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that you were going to tackle, that you were think looking at something through a Lutheran lens. And so I want to circle back and look at George Herbert himself through a Lutheran lens. When I posted okay. our book club discussion event page on Facebook, yeah. the first comment was, love this. I think Herbert was basically a Lutheran. <laughs> now, obviously... Technically, he was an Anglican. We're not saying that he wasn't an Anglican, but I wonder if you could comment on where the intersection is of yeah. Herbert's poetry and Lutheran theology. Can we can we look at a couple of poems as I Please. do that? Yeah, that'd be okay, great. Let's, we'll do that. And I'll go back to my dissertation and why I kind of jumped into this. Yeah. Herbert was... And it's also alive because after setting aside my dissertation and living life for a long time and raising two, two wild young men and everything else, <laughs> I actually have a book contract for my dissertation, Manchester University Press, to turn okay. this into something. So yeah. let's see if we can get that finished. All nice. right. One of the things that was happening during Herbert's lifetime that is underappreciated is that Johann Gerhard, the Lutheran dogmatician, who's probably most famous for his Loki and is probably the most, the third most famous Lutheran behind Martin and behind Chemnitz. Gerhard's Sacred Meditations, which is this series of devotion, book of devotional writings, was published in England, translated and published during Herbert's lifetime. And actually, Gerhard's Sacred Meditation becomes the most popular devotional text in England and by that, I mean the most commonly published devotional text for probably about 200 years. Wow. Now, he was never identified as a Lutheran, but uh, it was a fairly clean translation, and it retained much of its Christology and its sacramental theology, and it was a pretty Lutheran text. So what interested me was that I'm not going to say Herbert was Lutheran, but I will say I think he was reading some Lutheran stuff, and it certainly impacted and fed into his thinking, his devotional life, his, his theological acumen. It's a great debate about what kind of affiliation Herbert has. Like all good 17th century people in England, it was smart to not tell everybody what team you were on. Yes. <laughs> Don't wear the jersey. You know, there's a long history in the 20th century of associating Herbert with a more Anglo-Catholic kind of orientation. So Lewis Martz was probably the, the great critic of the 20th century that tied Herbert to Catholicism. And it was actually Ed Veith and Richard Stryer that were on the front end with some others of a different direction and aligning Herbert with a more Protestant kind of perspective. It, it probably most scholars still want to make him some form of confessing Calvinist. Mm. I don't think he makes a very good Calvinist, though. I've no. always pushed at that. And I, I think that's an easy answer because Calvinism had this sort of rising influence throughout the early 17th century in England. Uh, the poem I'll start with is, is sort of a, a place where I think it shows questions around. That. So while Herbert's not Lutheran, I think he's, he's interested in, the, in that kind of Lutheran ethos. So why don't we start with the pulley? Because that's like a great poem. Okay. And it, it gets us to these issues. Is it okay if I read it and then I'll talk about it a little oh, bit? Yes, please do. This is one of the few times, Sarah, where I can say that this material is <laughs> public domain. Yes. And we don't have to redact it for publication or for broadcast. Beautiful. I think that's true. So. That's beautiful. Go ahead. You know, and this is a great example of a poem, right, the, in that metaphysical tradition where there's an object that's taken and you know, imbued with greater significance than just, hey, it's about a pulley. So, all right. When God had first made man having a glass of blessing standing by, let us, said he, pour on him all we can. Let the world's riches, which dispersed lie, contract into a span. 
So strength first made a way, then beauty flowed, then wisdom, honor, pleasure. When almost all was out, God made a stay, perceiving that alone of all his treasure rest in the bottom lay. For if I should, said he, bestow this jewel also on my creature, he would adore my gifts instead of me and rest in nature, not the God of nature. So both should losers be. Yet let him keep the rest, but keep them with repining restlessness. Let him be rich and weary, that at least if goodness lead him not, weariness may toss him to my breast. Mm. That is a great poem. I'm just about to cry. <laughs> it's just a great poem. And it's this great, you know, again, it goes back to I think what I said before about this bringing together the narrative, the lyrical, as well as the dramatic. It's this sort of entering a cosmic conversation about how the persons of the Trinity are, hey, how are we going to make man? Like, this will yeah. be fun. And it's like this chemistry set is there. And how do we want to do this? I also see Pandora's box. Like this is the divine, <laughs> you know, antithesis mm -hmm. of you know, where all the evils come out, but only hope is left. Well, here all the blessings come out, yep. but only rest is uh, and it's this, And it's great puns in the, in the text too, but it's also, here's my chemistry set. Yeah. You know, the, the Trinity is playing with the chemistry set. We've got all this glass of blessings we're going to pour into creating the, the first human. And we'll pour on him all we can, which is great. I mean, it's this, there is this sort of understanding of God that's all about generosity and yeah. blessing. And it's, I, I don't want to, it's a little bit feminine and maternal and soft. It's not this angry God. It is mm. this loving, gentle understanding of God in his, in his most personal and caring. And mm. it's, a, it's a delightful image of that. We'll pour on him all we can. Let the world's riches, which disperses lie, contract into a span. We'll give human beings everything. And then you get the, the pouring in. So it's strength and beauty and wisdom and honor and pleasure. But then God stops and it's the pun on the word rest, perceiving that alone of all his treasure rest in the bottom leg. So we're going to give human beings everything and beauty and wisdom and honor and pleasure. But God stops and what's left, the remainder in the, in the glass is rest. And a nice pun on that. And, and then you get the calculus of why. For if I should bestow the jewel of rest on my creature, he would adore my gifts instead of me. I mean, it's this anticipation of you know, what human beings become, which is mm -hmm. trying to be their own mm -hmm. gods, right? <laughs> um, to rest in nature, not the god of nature. And it, it's this interesting kind of assumption from the voice of the Trinity. We'd both be losers. Yeah. You know, it, it's, I just love that. And this last stanza, it's just a wonderful pun again. Let him keep the rest, which is about... All the stuff that he's poured out the on beauty him. and the beauty strength and, and the wisdom, wisdom and yeah. pleasure and all of that. But it's also, it's that play on rest and restlessness. Let him mm -hmm. keep the rest, but keep them with repining restlessness. It's acknowledgement of how we live as Christians in the world. You know, post-fall, we are, you know, and this is Augustine, right? I, we will mm -hmm. be restless until we find our rest in God. He's, of course, referencing. Chapter one. It's that restlessness is... It's just who we are. You know, it is who we are in our sin. And we wander and we're aimless and we're never satisfied. And there's this search of we get the rest of God's blessings, but we're always searching for only what Christ can give, which is rest mm -hmm. and satisfaction and what we're promised in our baptism. Mm -hmm. We will have eternal rest eventually in heaven. And again, I think this is a very Lutheran impulse to live in paradox and to have something and not have it. For Herbert to say, let, God is saying, let him be rich and weary. You know, mm -hmm. we have everything in Christ and we also still long for the eschaton. Mm -hmm. We still long to be restored at the end of our journey to go home. And, you know, it's an interesting assumption. Goodness may not lead us to God. But then weariness, I think, what a lovely gentle image, and that childlike image, right? A parental and child image. Our goodness may not lead us to God. And there's always a suspicion in Herbert about our innate goodness. Mm. But weariness tosses us to his, 
to God's breast. You know, that that's, that's the place where we find home and find, find our ultimate satisfaction. And it's, it's there in Christ and in the church that, and it's, it's just such a gentle and paternal image. It's such a rare thing. Mm -hmm. You can see a a small child wandering off to play and not being willing to come back. But when the child gets really tired, really cranky, really just done with everything, Mm -hmm. they come toddling back. Oh yeah. Um, no, and that's her voice is often that. It's it's the it's the kind of cranky child trying to find his yeah. or her way home. And and I, I think this is just a very appealing, you know, and again, it's it, this isn't a, a poem that gives us what you might think of with Calvinism, which is a sort of predestined universe mm-hmm. where I know that I'm predestined, a member of the elect. And there's no dangling spiders in this. Well, no, this poem. is this is more of a I know I'm a sinner and I live in God's grace and mercy and his justifying work is what I cling to. And, and I live in a paradox of, or a duality of being rich and weary and restlessness and, and having rest. And it's, I love that complexity about it. I think it's existentially true and very, very much in alignment with how Lutherans have taught and, and wrestled with the faith yeah he does this in another poem another famous poem we should okay. look at the collar Can we yes, do that let's do that it was <laughs> that was the poem of his that i had read that didn't that actually made me want to read more oh as opposed to poem. easter wings which did not <laughs> Can i read this one rachel oh what you read so beautifully though all right okay. all right fine do it, rachel. Go for it rachel it's all just right. like class let's just, just drag like back 20 class. years that's <laughs> teach the teacher rachel let's go Could someone else put their hand up please yeah. <laughs> you knew i was gonna throw that at you, you I, i'm on. not surprised i did not know but anyway here we go the collar i struck the board and cried no more i will abroad what shall i ever sigh and pine my lines and life are free free as the road loose as the wind as large as store shall i be still in suit Have I no harvest but a thorn to let me blood and not restore what I have lost with cordial fruit? Sure, there was wine before my sighs did dry it. There was corn before my tears did drown it. Is the year only lost to me? Have I no bays to crown it? No flowers, no garlands gay, all blasted, all wasted. Not so, my heart, but there is fruit, and thou hast hands. Recover all thy sigh-blown age on double pleasures. Leave thy cold dispute of what is fit and not. Forsake thy cage, thy rope of sands, which petty thoughts have made, and made to thee good cable, to enforce and draw and be thy law, while thou didst wink and wouldst not see. Away! Take heed, I will abroad. Call in thy death's head there, tie up thy fears. He that forbears to suit and serve his need deserves his load. But as I raved and grew more fierce and wild at every word, methought I heard one calling, child. And I replied, my Lord. That's so good. It's a fantastic poem, too. See, we're getting the greatest hits here. Yeah. (laughs) So Collar writes the reference to anger, right? It also could be a reference to an animal's collar. Or a serf's collar. Or a serf's collar. And collar spelled differently for anger. That's the pun there. Mm-hmm. Some later critic tried to make it a clerical collar too. Yeah, I heard really that work. one, and I had I repeated that in an earlier episode introducing this book mm-hmm. club. But as I reread the poem, I was like, I think I was wrong there. I don't see. Mm-hmm. I don't see it. I think it's a professional church worker's poem. I yeah, do. It does. It does <laughs> definitely fit. I. Well, but it seminary, also I said that, but I, is a professional I, I, Christian's poem. <laughs> it is. You know, yeah. I've often, I mean, it's hard for me because I live in both worlds. I, I think this is the honest poem of someone who lives both professionally and as a Christian in the church. Mm-hmm. I really do. I think it needs, someone needs to say that, so I will. Yeah, it, it is, works. It does. And it's, can't, it's, and it's spoken by someone who lived in the church and was not always... It wasn't always an onward and upward kind of experience. And that's, mm-hmm. 
I think that is honest and it is one of the reasons I I come crawling back to his poetry. Yeah. And it's it's not unfaithful. It's no. it's what we're invited to do in scripture, to ask hard questions and to poke at our Lord. He is big enough and strong enough to handle these kinds of feelings and these kinds of experiences. And I it it may not be the most polite thing for us to say, but I do think it is a true thing to say that these are real things people experience. And and how does one process? And we watch the sort of psychological drama of, of Herbert's speaker as he wanders through all of this. It's probably his speaker is, is hitting the altar when he's, when he's speaking. The board is probably a communion table, not an altar, depending on what kind of Anglican church he's in. But it's, it's the priest in the church, angry, pounding yeah. on unholy things, saying, this isn't working for me. Well, there is not a pastor um, alive who has not at some point asked, have I no harvest but a thorn? Oh, mm-hmm. yeah. That yeah, and that's a theological of... question as well as a practical question mm-hmm. for the speaker. It's, you know, and, this, and it's this whole question of am I free or am I not free? Mm-hmm. And what, what does freedom mean? What does this, a life of service or servitude mean? And how do, how do we navigate that? I mean, the, the speaker is talking about my lines in life are free, free as the road, loose as the wind, as large as store. I should be able to go out and do great things. I'm smart. I've got the world's my oyster. Mm-hmm. You know, and then there's these references to farming, which is interesting because you know, Herbert's <laughs> living out in the, in the country. Have I no harvest but a thorn to let me blood and not restore what I have lost with cordial fruit? So I've done all this farming and all I get are thorns. No harvest that's worth my time or energy. Had wine, but I'm sighing all the time and that dried up my wine. And there was corn and I drowned it with my tears. <laughs> and I think one of the most haunting lines in this poem is the year only lost yeah. to me. I mean, how many of us look at a day, a week, a month, a year and say, I have, well, it's, I use this in my, in my, um, inauguration speech most haunting thing i think i'm going to ever think about as a president is uh richard ii's lines i have wasted time and now does time waste me that's the scary stuff our lord gives us this precious thing of time and opportunity and you hear the clock ticking and what if i'm wasting it Mm -hmm. what if i'm not doing what i mean those and those are that's the devil's playground at least for me and i think that's just you know, you're looking for success. You're looking for satisfaction. You're looking for a life. Hey, I, we accomplished something. I did something. My kids are okay. Why? Yeah. You know, I, it's, it was worth it. Even the sacrifices and whatever. And all of that is just on the table here for um, doubt. Yeah. And it's okay to struggle with that. I think that is, we all live that at some point. That's, that's why I love this poem. It wrestles honestly with the, I've given up everything. For this work, yep. please tell me it's worth it because I don't maybe see I, it right now. Yeah. And maybe I ought to go, I love the recover all thy side blown age on double pleasures. I mean, it's the 21st century, right? I like to go out and do whatever I want and yeah. go have fun. I just want to get um, in my car and keep driving. I'm going to Times Square and we're going to Vegas and we'll see what happens. It'll all be fun. <laughs> you know, and and it's, it's a great psychological study because... The speaker is saying to himself, leave thy cold dispute of what is fit and not forsake thy cage, thy rope of sands. It's this wild kind of, I've created my own internal intellectual prison here. Mm-hmm. I, I can go out and do things. But, you know, I, I guess I think I've signed up for this work and life. And, and then, you know, it's this mocking of God, too, which is risky. I get it. Mm-hmm. But around line 25 which petty thoughts have made and made to thee good cable to enforce and draw and be thy law while thou didst wink and would not see. If that, that's a cheap shot at God. Are you watching God? Are you seeing what's happening here while I do all this work and, and I'm feeling pretty miserable? You, are you noticing? Mm-hmm. And who hasn't prayed that prayer? Who hasn't yeah. asked, right? I mean, it's Can in you the see Psalms, me? so. Yeah, exactly. Why are you sleeping, God? Yeah, wake I up. I don't care. This isn't yeah. fun. I'm not having a good time yet. So mm-hmm. I, uh, it's it's a, it's just a wonderful confession there. Mm-hmm. 
And then that it's total postmodern advice, right? Tie up thy fears. He that forbears to suit and serve his need deserves his load. Mm -hmm. You're enough of an idiot to do this work, George. Get what you deserve. Yeah. Yeah. And then, she, I mean, Lindsay, <laughs> stepping back and being like self aware, the metacognition here is great too. But as I raved and grew more fierce and wild at every word, you know, I, I'm going nuts here. I'm losing my mind. Having a hissy fit. <laughs> my thoughts I heard one calling child, and I replied, my Lord. You know, which is the whole poem is, is Herbert Speaker just railing and going off sideways here. And, and then you get God's voice. You get this dramatic, and what a, you know, a risky play, right? You know, to introduce the speaker having a dialogue with God and one word, child. You know, and it so it becomes a baptismal poem. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's yeah. What, re what reorients, you know, Herbert Speaker here is, is the baptismal life. You know, I'm, I'm a child of God. And, it, you know, sometimes it can be critiqued, I suppose, as there's this authoritarian play by God. But I don't see that. I mean, that's why the yeah. use of the word child, it's parental. It's the tantrum that's being thrown here. I think Herbert's admitting I've been disrespectful as well as out of control. And, and all of that is restored and reoriented with that one word, mm -hmm. that reference to child. And that makes things right again. It makes things, or at least tolerable. All it yeah. takes is one syllable. Yeah. One yes. syllable of feeling like God cares. Yep. To set your whole world right. And it's that, and I think it's so powerful to put it in that baptismal imagery of who's we become, who, yeah. who is we, who we belong to and what that means. And it, it makes things restored. And whenever yeah. I read it out loud, my voice drops at that moment. I, as a mother, I know many ways to say the word child, child. <laughs> but I do not read it. My thoughts, I heard one colleague, child. <laughs> That would be interesting. Dramatically, how, how do we play that one out? See, I like it. It's kind of gentle child. Yeah. Child. Yeah. I, I think it's the gentle child. I think it's so the just the contrast between the raving, the fierceness, <laughs> the slapping furniture of <laughs> the poet versus the very gentle, restrained, soft, monosyllabic response. Well, I think part of that is is just because it's. I mean, it implies in the words that it, it wasn't this loud. He didn't clearly hear it. He says, me thoughts I heard one calling, like, like yeah. you're sort of questioning, did I actually even hear this voice? So it must be a quiet whisper almost. Yeah. No, that's good. Yeah. yeah. And it's, and then the raving stops. Mm -hmm. Like God speaking one word stops mm -hmm. our nuttiness and our, our self-absorption and it reorients to how we live. Just talking through the poems, like this is part of the reason why I mentioned to you, Rachel, that these poems are like this balm to my soul because this is what, 16th, 15th, 17th century? 17th century. 17th century poetry. Exactly. And it yeah. is still super relevant yeah. to like the human experience. Like nothing yeah. has changed. Like we're still sinners. We still go off and rage about our stuff. And like God is still God and he still takes care of us. Like it, nothing has changed. And I think that's part of what was just so awesome reading these the, reading this poetry like yeah the English is a little different than how I would write poetry now but the themes and the concepts and what this is confessing about God is still accurate and real it's so fresh yes yeah well and I'd also say gently where we want to align him I he, he may not have uh, been a confessional Lutheran but Herbert has an awful lot to say to us it's an amazing moment of where we see the church broadly and so beneficial yeah uh. Well, Dr. Ankerberg, I know you can't devote unlimited time to us. Well, I can do a little more. Oh, I'm you can do a little more? All right. Oh. Uh, what do you got for <laughs> us? Me? Oh, yeah, absolutely. We got all day. Can we, can we do two more poems? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Please. Priorities. <laughs> We're talking about poetry. Well, yes. <laughs> why don't we look at the whole past? Because that is a great poem. I used it in my inauguration speech. It's okay. one of my favorites. Say the name. And then we'll do Love Free, the third love poem. Yes! That makes what? I want that read at my funeral. So I love it. It's the we'll best one, that. in my opinion. Hold Fast is great. I threaten to observe the strict decree of my dear God with all my power and might. But I was told by one, it could not be, yet I might trust in God to be my light. 
Then will I trust, said I, in him alone. Nay, even to trust in him was also his. We must confess that nothing is our own. Then I confess that he, my succor, is. But to have not is ours, not to confess that we have not. I stood amazed at this, much troubled, till I heard a friend express that all things were more ours by being his. What Adam had and forfeited for all, Christ keep us now. He cannot fail or fall. So hold fast is like a tool for a carpenter that can hold a board down while they're working on it. Mm, so that's, okay. That's the kind of the image of another object that's used. Mm-hmm. And I, I think it's fair to say Christ is the hold fast, which sort of holds things together in our, in the Christian's life. I love this poem because it does, again, that, kind of building progression and you've got a speaker of, oh, I know how to be a Christian. I'm going to observe the strict decree and follow God. Mm -hmm. And then it's, there's this other voice told by one. It could not be, well, you might be able to trust in God to be your light. Well, okay, then I'll do this. I'll trust in God. I'll trust in him alone. But then he's told, well, nay, no, you can't do that. Even to trust in him, that's God's work too. (laughs) We must confess that nothing is our own. Then I confess that he, my sucker is. I'll confess that God is everything for me, my whole life and sustenance. And then the voice is telling him, well, to have nothing is ours, not to confess that we have nothing. (laughs) Uh What do you think? Another reason why I don't think he's a good Calvinist. Because it's, you know, it's a good Calvinist wouldn't talk in this way, I don't think, about the Christian faith. And it's very postmodern in a way, too. This is Mm -hmm. one of these times where I know we get anxious about this, but something is put forward, it's made, and then it's unmade at the same Mm -hmm. time. And it's a a very sophisticated way of thinking about and understanding how we live as human beings. And just when he thinks he's going to confess something that gets taken away from him, and just when he thinks he understands what the Christian faith is, oh, it goes in a different direction. And Mm -hmm. it's doesn't have the kind of stability that, that he wants to think. I stood amazed at this, much troubled, but I hear a friend express. And the friend, you know, that's often this reference to Christ, this veiled, that all the things were more ours by being his. That's Augustinian. I, it is. And it's, it's just great theology. You know, uh-huh. I, you know, it's, if anything is really going to be ours, it yeah. has to be Christ's first. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and that's where the things of value are. And I just yeah. love that line. I think about it shilling for my university, but that's what we ought to be doing and making sure all students understand. This should be on a t-shirt everybody gets. You know, all things are more ours by being his. We understand theology and the sciences and business by understanding how they can be Christ first and then they can be ours. And there's a, a wealth and a riches. It's just really different than anything we understand. When and it, stuff's just ours, it's just ours, and it's not very good. It goes for our people, too. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. When yes. we love our people through Christ instead of around Christ, then it's yeah. truer. I agree. And it frames our relationship so powerfully. Mm-hmm. You know, that we love our neighbor. We love all our neighbors. And for those who are owned and possessed fully by Christ, it takes away any ability we have to have separation. From them. Mm-hmm. You know, that, that even though we're separated, well, I think that what's interesting about this too is to think about those who have gone to, to be with our Lord. Mm-hmm. They're more ours. I mean, I love thinking, I often think about this line of communion rail, you know, with people who have gone to be with our Lord. They're his, they are with him. And at the communion rail, I'm, they're mine too. You know, it's, it's, it's a beautiful kind of understanding of how we can possess things we don't know we possess because they belong to Christ and they're in Christ. And it's a, it's a very kind of, point of phrase, a um, metaphysical kind of understanding of, of things. Well, if you're I mean, shilling for Concordia, I can say there's a great article on this very subject coming out in the March Lutheran Witness, I believe. <laughs> Outstanding. I'm very happy to hear that. Yes. <laughs> and then you get the great contrast at the end. So Adam screws things up, right? You know, he forfeited everything, but the yeah. new Adam Christ, you know, 
keep us, keeps everything for us and die, does and has everything. So it's not about our striving for we're going to get and keep and have. He does it all. And then you got the, the alliterative, Christ cannot fail or fall. Mm. It's, it's a lovely conclusion to the poem. And I think it's a sonnet, too, if I don't. It is mistaken. an Elizabethan sonnet. I was mm. counting in syllables while you were talking. There you go. I trained you well, Rachel. Can we do one more poem? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Let's do the, let's do the poem for my, my funeral here. Yeah. I right. love poem. Yeah, he's a good... We've been talking about how, what a good Christian and what a good theologian he is and what a good thinker he is, but he's also a really good poet. Yeah. There's so yes. much interesting and skillful stuff happening here that just is and very really classically powerful. trained so he mm-hmm. knows the forms he knows you know, the, the lyrical style you know the all of that is he is he is immersed in the best of the poetic tradition of the west yeah so the third love poem we haven't talked about how these poems are organized oh we should it's re- probably it's interesting in the temple this collection of poems you know, we don't know, you know, I don't think it was accidental. I, I love the metaphor of a map that mm. poems are really trying to form and, and demonstrate or live out different pathways on a journey and, and provide different opportunities as one reads through the collection. But the third love poem is a great concluding poem for the, this collection because it's really about the home and about the destination and you know, again, it does this great work of being this dramatic poem, this dialogue poem around the speaker and God. Love made me welcome, yet my soul drew back guilty of dust and sin. But quick-eyed love, observing me grow slack from my first entrance in, drew nearer to me, sweetly questioning if I lacked anything. A guest, I answered, worthy to be here. <laughs> Love said, you shall be he. I, the unkind, ungrateful, ah, my dear, I cannot look on thee. Love took my hand and smiling did reply, who made the eyes but I? Truth, Lord, but I've marred them. Let my shame go where it doth deserve. And know you not, says Love, who bore the blame. My dear, then I will serve. You must sit down, says love, and taste my meat. So I did sit and eat. I, this, and you know, I'll try not to have feelings here. Because this poem, it just does to me every time I read it. But it's very much part of a courtly love tradition. Yeah. A love poem in the, in the sense of how two earthly lovers would interact with one another. And it's, Herbert certainly has that in mind. And that's appropriate you know, when we think about the marriage feast of the Lamb and the, the relationship between Christ and his church, that, that's also echoing through this as well. And love is personified as Christ. And, I, it's, and it's this interesting sort of come close and I can't come close to you. And that, mm-hmm. that whole invitation and then pushing back. Love welcoming me, but the speaker pulling back and and one of the things that Herbert's poems always focus on, there's this repetition of the word dust throughout all, so many of his poems. Right. It is, it's both the essence of creation and it's also the consequence of our sin. And it's, it's a great image, powerful image tied to both creation and the artist right. as well as death and what we struggle with. And, and I just love these references, right? Quick eyed love. Mm-hmm. What a great reference. Christ is quick eyed. You know, he, abs- you know, we saw it in the collar where you're watching God, or you know, what's going on, paying attention. This is the answer to that. Yes. Yes, he is. Great moment in Luther talking about the Abraham narrative and Hagar leaves with Ishmael, part of that narrative. And she's out in the desert. And there's this interesting moment where she, where God speaks to her and restores her, sends her back, takes care of her. And she makes this reference to God as the God who sees. Yes. Mm. And I think Luther calls that the best name for God. 
in in the scriptures. And I've always that's with me. And I think it's in this poem. He is the God who sees, and that is powerful. And so we try to pull back, you know, Herbert's speakers, like I I am not worthy of being here. But the persistence of God and this this image of how God behaves and the anthropomorphizing of God, of this is how God interacts with us. God draws nearer to us and sweetly questions if we lack anything. You know, going back to that awareness of what we have and don't have. And of course, Herbert says, you know, there's no guest here that's worthy. It ain't me. And love says, well, you're the one. But I'm unkind and I'm ungrateful. I can't even look at you, God, which is a great contrast again to the God who sees. We can't even look at God. We can't interact with him, but he sees us. And then it's the touch. The love comes to us closely, takes our hand and reminds us of, again, for an artist to say and to identify God as the ultimate artist. I made the eyes. Mm -hmm. I created the eyes. So of course you can look at me. And it's that touch, which is also very Eucharistic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What happens at the altar is we get touched. And that's, that's an important thing. And the speaker then says, yeah, but I've marred these eyes. Let my shame go where it doth deserve. That is such a statement. Like it's escalation mm-hmm. here. Mm. Let my shame go where it doth deserve. Yes. Is, yeah. Why won't you just let me go to perdition? Which is where yes. I ought to be. We both know that. Yeah. And again, I don't think this is how a Calvinist would talk either. No. And it's a wonderful statement about it. And we see this progression in several of these poems of it, this sort of building tension of and drama. And he knows where he ought to he shouldn't be there. He knows he doesn't belong there. He knows he should be going where he does deserve. And here's the calculus and the economy of God, which operates in a completely different way. And no, you're not, says love, who bore the blame. This, this, and it's this hit for tat. And again, I think that is such an important part of the dialogue nature of this. It's not just Herbert Speaker being pious. It's, these are the deep, hard back and forth conversations we want to have with our savior. We have to speak honest things to him in the liturgy and in our faith and in our prayers and our reading of scripture. And he says back the exact things we need to hear. And then, you know, again, it's framed. Well, I know I've got this figured out. I'll serve you. Right. Right. I, you know, I don't both, you know, even if I've got to be here, I guess I'll serve. Maybe I can earn some love or I can earn my status like or my the place. prodigal son, no. like, oh, make me one of your yeah, servants. And then totally. Yeah. Yes. It is exactly what he, what he's playing off of here that, and, it, and it's our very human thing. We, there's gotta be a way I can earn my status for God mm-hmm. and it, I'll negotiate with him, you know, in the, in the best tradition of humanity, I'll negotiate with God and <laughs> this my well. best play. I'll serve you. I'll show you. And. All gets turned upside. All of these plays by the speaker, whether it's guilt or service or it all gets turned in a different direction. God's answer upends Herbert's speaker at every turn. And then it's it's not my service. It's he serves us Mm -hmm. and feeds us. And uh, we receive what he gives us. It's just, you know, and that's, that's the gift of eternity, right? Mm -hmm. That's, that's what we will experience in heaven, what we experience at the altar. It's a, it's so gentle too. And but it's, it's forceful. Upending. It says you oh, must yes. sit down, says love. Oh, yeah. Yes. And there's no negotiating. I mean, he tries everything. And he, it's, God will not be, will not accept his terms. And it's not mean either. It's not no. an angry God. It's a, it is a persistent God mm-hmm. and a loving God. And mm-hmm. then. And I, it's, it's stuff that resonates with, with hope. Mm -hmm. It's a word I've used. Herbert always has hope. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's why so many of the poems brought me, if not to tears, almost to tears. (laughs) Because hope is so rare in our world today that to find something that is infused Mm -hmm. straight through with hope and means it Mm -hmm. like not like a commercial type of hope, but a, something that is rooted in the only real reason for hope that we have. Yeah. Well, and that I think this poem for me, it's so powerful because it, 
you know, we opened by talking about all these issues around finding the satisfied life and trying to find the life of preferment and vocation. And, you know, did I, have I done enough? Have I been good enough? And that's why I call this my funeral poem, because it's kind of, you show up at the end of your life and all the things that Herbert Speaker wants to drag into the conversation with God are irrelevant. Mm. Just that all is set aside and it's going to be all about what he's given us in terms mm -hmm. of what he's created, what he's made, how he sees us, how he feeds us. And it's rest. I come back to that word. It's, mm -hmm. it's my restlessness finds its rest here. That's there is such comfort in that for me. Beautiful. I love it. It's Good so stuff. much fun to read poetry together. <laughs> Can we do this again sometime? Do we I would love to. to. The spinoff yeah. podcast. <laughs> we could do that. We know, we know you're out there. Do you have any other internet. favorite metaphysical poets that we should uh, mm. get to? I'm still, I still, I have absolutely no business doing this, but I still help edit Scintilla, which is a journal related to Henry Vaughn's poetry. Vaughn's Henry? good. I've never heard of Vaughn. He didn't oh. even make it in the anthologies. All right, yeah. writing down. <laughs> Henry Vaughn's good. He's, he's he's complicated. You know, it's all this. You know, he's contemporary Milton, and it's all this Civil War stuff in the seventeenth uh, century. So I love Milton. But we should read Milton together. Really, you think we're up for that? <laughs> we could do Paradise Lost. We could do a bunch of podcasts on. Paradise yeah, I was going to say that will not be a single episode <laughs> podcast. That's not a single one. We just kind of go through. <laughs> Oh man. All right. Gotta, I would be I'm game for that. I totally would. I, ha it's been probably a year and a half since I last read Paradise Lost and I'm due for a read. Only a year and a half. Right. Yeah, oh God. How terrible of you. I, As opposed to the maybe two times I've read it. <laughs> okay. Like 10 years well, no, I was, so. But you know, it, the older I get, the more I <laughs> just want to come back to some of these great oh, yeah. works of spiritual sacred literature because they've feed your soul in a really powerful mm -hmm. way mm -hmm. and there are some that as soon as i finish them i want to start over again because there's so many things mm -hmm. that i caught that i didn't catch the time before mm -hmm. so yep. yeah that would be that would be more fun than i should be allowed to have honestly the lutheran ladies do poetry featuring <laughs> Dr. The lutheran ladies live in near <laughs> you <laughs> well, thank you so much for the opportunity. This has been very generous of you to sit and talk about poetry with me. So oh. this is great. Well, thank you for gifting us with your time and your insights. Well, it's an honor. And your honor deep passion honor. for this. Yeah. I do have a deep passion for it. It has been so fun to just sit here and listen to both of you talk about poetry. I have learned so much. Agreed. And it's been a lovely hour of my life listening to y'all. So Dr. Ankerberg, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today. Great to be with you. Aaron, nice to meet you. Sarah, nice to see you again. Well, that was fun. <laughs> that was so fun. <laughs> it was. <laughs> wow. I mean, I'm glad you guys had fun too, because there is nothing I would just about rather do than sit and drink tea and talk about poetry. So thank you for coming along on Rachel's Wild Ride. Yeah. <laughs> we are actually doing this a little out of order. Normally, we would reference our discussion in the Lutheran Ladies Book Club Facebook page. We, that has not happened yet due to our schedule and Dr. Ankerberg's schedule. We needed to record our recap discussion before we actually had our discussion. But I honestly, I'm really pleased that things worked out this way because it allowed all three of us to sharpen our understanding of these poems before we come and talk about them with you. So yeah, yeah, I, I feel like that worked out really well. But we are not going to mention any insightful comments from our readers this time, our fellow readers, because they haven't been uttered yet. Yep. Right. So thanks for your patience there. Any final thoughts before we close the book on the temple? I'm just glad we did it. That was I. I am too. For me, reading the holy and hearing. Dr. Ankerberg read the pulley made me want to go back and read even more of the poems that I have not yet gotten to as hidden gems because that was not on your original highlighted list. <laughs> but yeah, there's it was so hard to pick out just a list. Uh -huh. Well, and you're right, like, there's I mean, so I'm like, oh, clearly, <laughs> yeah, there's more good gems and meat in here. So 
Yeah. Yeah. yeah there's the whole fact. Amazing. Yeah. 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 <sighs> so basically, I just need to like, I just mm-hmm. need to like, Zoom call Dr. Inkerberg and just read the book <laughs> with him so I actually understand what's happening. That's <laughs> You guys yeah. cannot, yeah. Even, <laughs> cannot even imagine oh. how much fun it was to have him for a oh, professor. Oh. And, like, yeah. yeah. You know, study literature. Yeah. Amazing. So. Yes. If you, like Aaron, have only dipped in and out of this collection, which is fine. That honestly is a perfectly Mm -hmm. valid way to read poetry. You don't generally read poetry cover to cover. Mm -hmm. You dip in, you dip out. But if you, like Aaron, haven't quite finished yet, go back and you will be surprised at how many of these poems will literally take your breath away. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, I think I almost had like a, like, what's a positive panic attack? (laughs) <laughs> yeah panic attack but positive when i was reading i think it was the sacrifice and something oh. he did with mm-hmm. the un- unexpected meter just like <laughs> i was like <laughs> breathless yeah hyperventilating <laughs> <laughs> so there are so many good ones here i also want to put in a recommendation now sarah you and aaron both bought a collection that was just the temple a hardback yeah. mm-hmm. i it's a beautiful book by the way it I'm is beautiful the more expensive one. <laughs> yeah. No, I want to get that one too. But I actually bought a Penguin Classics edition of George Herbert, The Complete Poetry, which mm. about two thirds of it, well, about one third of it is footnotes. But of the part that remains, about two thirds of it is the temple because that was the ah. bulk of Herbert's poetry. Mm. But the last mm-hmm. section of it is his Latin poetry. Oh, and wow. this volume, I, I won't read the translations because they aren't public domain yet, but it has if you have any Latin students, this would be a great thing to set them on because it wow. is uh, interlinear. Well, not interlinear, but like page by page. But there are some wonderful poems in here that are not included in the temple. One that particularly got me was one called Memoriae Matris Sacrum, a sacred gift in memory of my mother, which he wrote oh. after his mother died. So, all you faithful Lutheran mothers out there, it's a longish poem. You know, probably twenty pages long but just gorgeous. There's another one that where he's, and this is one reason why I agree with Dr. Ankerberg that he's not a very good Calvinist, <laughs> is what I would like to call a 17th century rap battle between him <laughs> and a prominent Puritan thinker of the time, <laughs> where he yeah. is making a defense of some of the sacramental and liturgical elements yeah. of church life that were being discarded at that time by the Puritans. And of course, as Lutherans who embrace these liturgical and sacramental elements, it's Hmm. very satisfying to see someone come with and 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 basically put the whole full force of his sharpened wit to this problem of defending these. I I laughed out loud during that one. So if you have not yet bought a volume of George Herbert poetry, think about getting one that includes the Latin poems because they just add to the richness of the whole thing. It's just beautiful. That's awesome. I know a lot of ladies commented when uh, you mentioned that we were going to be doing George Herbert poetry. There were a lot of ladies coming out of the woodwork that were like, I love George Herbert. This is amazing. So that's going to be a fun discussion. In the- well, yeah. And looking the discussion that. happens when we post this podcast in the group. Too. Yeah. <laughs> yep, it will. But yeah, so I'm going to keep dipping in and out of George Herbert probably for the rest of my life. So that is a gift that will keep on giving itself to me as a result of this book club discussion. But I think we need now probably to talk about what we're reading next. We need a new book. We do. And full disclosure, (laughs) I forgot going into this recording session that we needed a new book. (laughs) Great job. (laughs) So what's the opposite of that positive panic attack I mentioned earlier? An actual panic attack. Actual panic (laughs) attack. But I should not have worried. My fellow co-hosts are also very literate women who have my back (laughs) at all times. Erin, I know, keeps a running list of cool books that she's read. And we were going to dip into that until Sarah interrupted and said, hey, did you know I've never read Little Women or Anne of Green Gables? (laughs) It's true. At which point the conversation screeched to a halt. Yes. And I said, oh, well, let's do that then. (laughs) 
I started Little Women because my friend gave the book to me and was like, you have to read this. Why have you never read this? I proceeded to start it and get a few pages in and I like didn't. And then now I'm just reading leadership stuff. And so I need something. I need a reason Mm -hmm. to actually read this book because I know I need to read it. So yeah. And I, so I think both of these books would be excellent for us to do. I put my vote in for Little Women because Mm -hmm. I think Louisa May Alcott is a profoundly deep thinker and wonderful, deeply moral woman. You know, she definitely, her work is infused with something deeper and richer than your average, you know, children's fiction is. Mm, yeah. <laughs> so I would love a chance to talk about that with you ladies and with the ladies in our group to see mm-hmm. if they see what I see. And whether we all agree with my opinion that no film adaptation has ever quite captured that side of Louisa May Alcott's work. <laughs> <laughs> this will be a fun, well, first of all, this will be a nice, easy read. I, I'm assuming it's an easy read, but also intergenerational. Like this is, oh, this yeah. is moms and daughters can do this mm-hmm. together, which, which yeah. would be nice. Except my daughters. Yeah. Well, because I, they refuse to read it. They well, like I, Louisa May Alcott. My, one of my daughters just reread Eight Cousins and its sequel, Rose and Bloom. Over Christmas the Eight break. So they Cousins like and Rose and Bloom. Yeah. That might be my favorite of hers. But whenever I try to le- read Little Women to them, they stop me and tell me it's too cringe. So, <laughs> all right. Well, <laughs> but other mothers may have better luck. And maybe this will be the time when there's some motivation for them to actually yeah. <laughs> dig into this. Yeah. Now, I'm looking so forward beautiful. to rereading Little Women. It's really it's been a long time since I read it. And these sort of classics, I always get something new out of it. Like Dr. Yeah. Anker wrote saying, you read it and you're a new person from when you were the last time you read it. And so you experience new new insights. So I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. Yeah. This will be fun. We're going to read Little Women by Louisa May Alcott. And I'm very, very excited. And I already have this. It's literally sitting on my desk with a bookmark where I stopped reading it like 10 pages in. So... This will be in the Facebook group in a couple of months. Is that? I'm not sure we have actually put this one on the calendar yet. I believe this will be after Easter. That's we, that's a good plan. <laughs> we tend we not to do book club during Lent. Yeah, it loosely is aimed it for is, after it'll Easter. Be, it, yes, middle of April. Middle of April. Middle yep. of April. So you've got some time. Enjoy this blustery winter. Curl up with that cup of tea in front of a fireplace if you have one, and enjoy. One of the coziest of cozy reads, which is mm-hmm. our mm-hmm. wonderful pick, Little Woman. Thank Yay. you, Sarah. This You're is going to be fun. I'm super excited. <laughs> As usual, ladies, you can join all of our discussions for book club in the Lutheran Ladies Lounge Facebook group. They show up as events. Rachel posts an event and then you just RSVP is going. And that's all it is. It's asynchronous, which means Rachel posts questions and then we respond whenever we have time and then discussion ensues. So be on the lookout for that in the Facebook group. You can also follow us on Instagram at Lutheran Ladies Lounge. And we do post book club questions in our on our Instagram page as well. So you can answer those there if you're not on Facebook. You can sign up for our e-newsletter by sending us an email, lutheranladies at kfuo.org. And of course, you can find all of our podcast episodes at kfuo.org slash Lutheran Ladies Lounge or on the KFUO radio app or on your favorite podcasting app. You're listening to the Lutheran Ladies Lounge podcast. I'm Sarah. I'm Erin. And I am a very, very happy Rachel right now. <laughs> just, just very happy. This is like a highlight episode for you. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Dreams came true today, my friends. Dreams came true. <laughs> Views and opinions expressed on the Lutheran Ladies Lounge podcast may not represent the official position of the management or ownership of KFUO Radio, the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. The Lutheran Ladies Lounge is produced by KFUO Radio and available at kfuo.org or wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and leave a review for us, too. If you love the Lutheran Ladies Lounge podcast, consider financially supporting our producer, KFUO Radio, so we can keep doing what we do. Find out how at kfuo.org slash give.